I have felt cruddy after a fast before. I have felt bloated. I have felt fatigued. I have felt like I had an irregular heart rate. I've even had situations where I've gained weight and I've talked to literally hundreds, possibly even thousands of people that have experienced the same kind of things. Okay, so finally, there is some pretty solid evidence that really demonstrates what I've been talking about for so many years in terms of why it's good to not break your fast with so many carbohydrates. And this doesn't mean that carbohydrates are bad. That's not what I'm saying. But right when you break a fast, it is a very important time to be strategic. And carbohydrates could be throwing a wrench that makes it dangerous. It could also have an effect on the inflammation that occurs after a fast. And probably what you're concerned about the most, it can have an anti-lipolytic effect, putting a screeching halt to fat loss, or at least slowing it down. You see, most of these problems occur because we're having too big of a spike of insulin. Does this mean that insulin's a huge problem? No, it means that after a fast, we are insulin sensitive, which means that the effects of insulin are going to be more pronounced, good and bad. So the first thing that I have to address is one I've talked about before. So stick with me on it because it does play into the other components I'm talking about. This is something called refeeding syndrome. Typically only applies to people that are fasting for maybe 18, 20, 22 hours plus. But essentially what's happening here is during a fast, the cells in your body actually decrease the amount of minerals that are in them, and those minerals go into your bloodstream. So believe it or not, at the plasma blood level, you have pretty good amounts of minerals, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, um, you know, all that stuff. But then what happens is because the blood levels are stable, your cellular levels are low. So when you break a fast with carbohydrates, you have an insulin spike. This insulin spike acts as a doorman and opens the cellular door back up. As soon as that door opens back up, it's like opening a door that's been sealed underwater. You open that door and all of a sudden, all the water's gonna rush in, right? All those minerals and all that glucose is gonna rush in because insulin opened the door. What does this do? Why is it a big deal? Well, now your blood levels of minerals that were nice and elevated now dramatically went down before the body has time to stabilize because everything rushed into the cell, leading to being fatigued, leading to feeling sometimes nauseous and dizzy, and because the water draws in with it, you feel dehydrated and just generally fatigued. That's why after a fast, a lot of times you just don't really want to work out. You feel drained. So before we get into the nitty gritty with inflammation, before we get into the anti-fat loss, anti-lipolytic effects, when it comes down to carbohydrates or insulin at the end of a fast, let me just give you a simple playbook. Breaking a fast with protein is always the best bet, okay? Protein is going to spike insulin, but it also spikes glucagon, so you have a neutral effect, okay? That way you're also prioritizing protein and prioritizing the rebuilding before anything else. It doesn't mean you cannot have carbohydrates at some point later in the day, but protein needs to be the emphasis. I consider it a miniature meal that you break your fast with, and then the real meal comes in later. So this miniature meal can be as simple as a protein shake. I just want you to prioritize protein and only protein. So it can be some lean steak, it can be chicken, it can be protein shake, you name it. I keep some protein powder in my car with me so that when I'm fasting and I break my fast, I just have some protein and then 30 minutes, six minutes later, I can have a larger meal. I put a link down below for the protein I use. It's called Sun Warrior, okay? And they have one that is called their Active Line. I really like it because it's pumpkin protein and pea protein. It's got a nice mix there. Plus it's lower carb, so it works with, you know, any kind of like ketogenic or lower carb protocol, but also has enzymes and also has a little bit more of a probiotic effect. Very cool stuff. It's called their Active line and that link down below will save you 20% off so you want to use that code that's there too so in the description that is a special code because Thomas DeLauer recommended it so it's got my stamp of approval so that code that's down there is going to get you 20% off so make sure you check them out after this video inflammation at first we think it's automatically the worst thing ever inflammation is required for our bodies it's not the end of the world and full disclaimer, once again, whenever you're eating, inflammation is going to be higher. It's a natural response to food, okay? So don't get me wrong here. But it's also been very, very clearly demonstrated that during a fast, inflammatory markers go down, specifically something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. In fact, studies have demonstrated that during a fast, your NLRP3 master switch inflammasome 
is two and a half X lower during a fast than just three hours after breaking a fast. So that shows the contrast. Once you break a fast, inflammation goes way up. Sometimes a little too extreme, which we're gonna talk about right now. The journal Nutrition and Biochemistry published an interesting study. It was a rodent model study, so you know, be warned. So these mice went on a 48 hour fast. After the fast, researchers had them uh, do one of three types of diets. They either broke their fast with a standard diet, which was 60% carbohydrates, or they consumed 100% carbohydrates, or they went into what they considered a low carb uh, group, which was 38% carbohydrates. Not exactly low, low, but lower than the others. Well, the results were interesting. The 60% carbohydrate group and the 100% carbohydrate group had significantly higher levels of what is called CXCL10, one, two, and also LCAM was elevated. So what this means is that they had pretty serious chemokine increases, or chemokine, potato, potato, right? These are things that are like little soldiers when it comes down to inflammation that are usually regulated by a master switch. So inflammation genes get flipped on, and as a result, all these chemokines go and they do their little soldier job. Not a good thing. Well, I guess it is if you're sick, but not just normally. The interesting thing was this was dose dependent. That's why it's so crazy. The more glucose, the more carbohydrates, the more that it seemed to have a pronounced effect. Now, the reason that this happens is really fascinating. It has something to do with what is called a TLR2, or a toll-like receptor. This toll-like receptor is what flips that gene expression on. So here's a really cool analogy that makes some sense with it. I want you to imagine there's a school building, and that school building has a janitor, okay? And this janitor is the toll-like receptor, okay? So this janitor is going around before school starts, and he's turning on all the radiator heaters in all the rooms. It's an old school. They have radiator heaters still. So he's turning on all the radiator heaters to warm up the school. Those radiator heaters are going to be the uh, genes. Okay, he's flipping them on, he's expressing the genes. It's a cold morning, so he goes in and he flips them on. Okay, he turns them on in some rooms, some in others. He goes to the cafeteria, he turns on four out of the eight, right? Gets the temperature nice and warm. The next day, he goes to do the same thing, except this time he's had a bunch of sugar. So this janitor is hopped up on sugar, he's sprinting around the building, and he's turning on all the heaters. He's flipping, he's expressing all of these genes. This toll-like receptor is now expressing all of the genes, and guess what happens? The school is like 120 degrees, and everyone is sweltering and miserable. They're inflamed. This is a perfect analogy of what is happening. Okay, we overactive because the toll-like receptor is hopped up on, in this case, glucose. Well, at least that's a simple way of explaining it. Now, there was also a study that was published in the Journal of Diabetes Research, and this one was interesting because it was in vitro, so don't get me wrong, it was an in vitro study that took a look at kidney cells. So it doesn't mean it directly is going to apply into humans, but we still have to like look at bigger picture data than smaller picture data. And again, rodent model, you can't 100% take it to the bank, okay? In vitro, you definitely can't 100% take it to the bank, but we can add things together. What they found is that there was once again a glucose dose-dependent increase in NLRP3 inflammasome as well as interleukin-1 beta. So what that means is when they exposed these cells to glucose, they had an increase in the NLRP3 inflammasome, inflammation. The more glucose they added to the dish, the more the inflammation increased. Not a huge surprise because again it is somewhat dose dependent but researchers in this particular case were trying to link diabetic neuropathy uh, with this whole thing. So they were really positive with how the results came out but again we have to see it in humans to really be able to say it with certainty and even then we don't say it with certainty. So we know that if we break our fast with a bunch of carbohydrates, we potentially increase the inflammatory response too much. But be warned that no matter what, you're going to have an inflammatory response that comes from food. It's not gonna be nil, you're still gonna have that. If you're really concerned about it, staying in a lower carb protocol with a higher fat, higher protein, lower carbohydrate, low sugar, low refined starch might be the better route for you. Now let's talk about the anti-lipolytic effect. Now lipolysis means fat burning. It means where you are breaking apart triglycerides that are fat in their storage form and turning them into fuel, breaking them into fatty acids so they can be turned into fuel. You become much more sensitive to insulin during a fast, okay? Insulin, it's fairly known that it has an anti-lipolytic effect, meaning when insulin is present, fat loss temporarily slows down while insulin is present because of how it acts upon a cell. If you're sensitive to insulin, that would make sense. That with great power comes great responsibility. You have to be more careful that that insulin spike might also affect fat loss even more. The Journal of Applied Physiology had published a paper that was really cool because it took the style of fasting that I like. It took intermittent fasting every second day 
for 20 hours. So every second day, participants fasted for 20 hours, and they did this for 15 days. Well, the cool thing is, first off, they found that compared to baseline, there was an increase in insulin-mediated glucose uptake, meaning that the body became more sensitive to insulin, and as a result, soaked up more glucose into the muscle cell. This is great because we're insulin sensitive, but it also means that we're much more prone to the anti-lipolytic effects of insulin, which doesn't mean don't ever eat a carb, but it means that if you were to have some fat loss that were to occur after your fast, there's no better certain way to shut it down more than having a bolus of carbohydrates and having too much, because it's not only gonna slow down fat loss via the anti-lipolytic effects of insulin, but it's going to aggressively stop them because you're more sensitive to it. Ultimately, there was a greater insulin-induced inhibition of lipolysis. Point blank. What ends up happening is because of this amplified antilipolytic effect, you're much more sensitive to everything that's going on. So you also have an increase in what's called adenopectin, which is a good hormone that's secreted by fat. But when you have a lot of adenopectin that is secreted, what happens is the cells take up more glucose, including the fat cells. So if a fat cell soaks up more glucose, you run more of a risk of that fat cell turning glucose into fat. It's called de novo lipogenesis, and I know it's getting complicated here, but let me paint it very simply. You're sensitive to insulin, so you eat a bunch of carbohydrates. Insulin spikes, okay? Fat cell doorway opens, and it opens wide. A bunch of glucose goes into the fat cell. Well, now that that glucose is in a fat cell, it can get brainwashed by the fat to turn into fat. It's called de novo lipogenesis. And in this particular case, it's much more pronounced. Because what ends up happening is insulin also drives up what is called pyruvate dehydrogenase and also acetyl-coenzyme A carboxylase, which are two enzymes that help turn sugar into fat. So not only do you have more sugar going into the fat cell, but you also have more enzymes that are turning that sugar into fat inside the fat cell. Not to mention the pronounced effect of insulin in terms of slowing down how fat can be liberated in the first place. When insulin is present, hormone-sensitive lipase, which is an enzyme that breaks down fat to be burned, does not release as much. Over time, it inhibits hormone-sensitive lipase from doing its job. I hope that you don't get the wrong idea by thinking carbohydrates are bad with this, and I wanna make that super clear, because if you know me and you follow me, I'm not opposed to carbohydrates. I strategically implement them. I think they have a very important role and I think they're part of our general makeup. But when you are breaking a fast, once again, with great power comes great responsibility. It's not that hard of a pill to swallow. And I know some people will say, oh, eat some carbohydrates, do this. I really don't think so. Break your fast with proteins, then later on bring the carbohydrates in if you even want to at all. That is up to you. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and don't mess up. See you tomorrow.